All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you guys uh, hear us and see us? Hey, everybody. Hey. Can we get a confirmation in the chat that you guys can hear us and see us? Perfect. Awesome. Wow, they all came, came in at the same time. Well, thank you guys so much for, for joining in uh, on this beautiful Monday. Uh, so today with us, we have, uh, my name is Victor Bunyan, uh, and then we have Aaron Henshaw and McLean Wilkinson. Um, I want to do a quick round of introductions, and maybe I'll just kick us off. Um, I lead up the protocol operations team at Bison Trails um, and work a lot on, on all kinds of different protocols, work with different teams within Bison Trails to help us do our best work with protocols. Uh, and I've been, you know, have known and been working with McLean for going on one or two years now. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, at least yeah. probably probably two. When was Denver? Uh, East Denver. That was I think yeah, like two years ago. Person, yeah, <laughs> crazy. Um, Aaron, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey, I'm Aaron. I'm a CTO, co-founder of Bison Trails. Um, and similarly, we've been looking at New Cipher for a very long time. Um, really excited about. Uh, it's uh, progress and where we are now, it's work clock. Uh, and then I'm McLean Wilkinson. I am one of the co-founders and the CEO of, of New Cypher. Um, have been working with uh, the Bison Trails team for, you know, as I said, a couple years, I think at this point, um, from running you know, early sort of internal federated test set nodes and, and obviously the work that they're doing now um, to help us get prepped and ready for, for mainnet. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to start off with just, an, you know, McLean, if you could help us give an overview of, of a new cipher. Um, and I think maybe also help people. It's it's not always an intuitive concept for folks that um, aren't in the space or aren't dealing with, with access or cryptography. Um, so not only explain it, but also can you give some examples of like use cases where it makes sense or like problems that it's solving to help make it very real for people? Sure. So the, the new Cypher network is a essentially a layer two network on top of Ethereum. Um, so it's a network of, of nodes that are run by um, what we call stakers, different people in the community. So these nodes are operated by Bison Trails, operated probably by a lot of you that are watching this webinar, by a bunch of our university staking partners and you know, many other people around the world. But these nodes basically provide uh, threshold cryptography services. Um, the first version of that is something called proxy re-encryption, but in principle, the network is very well suited to doing any kind of threshold cryptography. Um, and in practice, <clears throat> what that means in terms of use cases is it's really not something that like an end user, like you or I and like our sort of day-to-day -day life would use. Um, it's more of like a middleware or a developer tool that someone building an application would use. Um, so to try to sort of make it a really simple example would be, let's say you are building some sort of medical records uh, application on top of Ethereum and you know, some decentralized storage layer like IPFS. Uh, the tricky piece is like, how do you store these sensitive records on a public storage layer, but still have them be encrypted um, so that only you can access them, but also share them with the appropriate people. So we call this like access control. So how can you control who can or cannot access these sensitive records? Um, and this is a particularly a sort of difficult issue in the context of like you know, decentralized applications where you're storing this data like you know, not in a secure data center somewhere, but you know, on a node in a network, and you have no idea who controls that node. It could be you know, a hacker, it could be a criminal, it could be you know, a malicious nation state, for example. So we need some way to like uh, in a cryptographically sort of secure manner control who can and cannot access that data. So we don't even want to expose that data to the storage layer. It only should ever be accessed by you, know, you like the, the patient or the data owner and whoever you explicitly grant access to. Um, and so most of the sort of early users right now are obviously sort of web three applications, decentralized applications, um, other decentralized protocols that sort of are building in this sort of decentralized um, context and can't just rely on like some single server to control access. Um, and so the, the first uh, the first threshold cryptography primitive um, that we've deployed onto the network is this thing called proxy re-encryption, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more later. 
But in principle, you could deploy all sorts of threshold cryptography primitives like threshold signatures or Shamir secret sharing, uh, distributed key generation, a lot of interesting things uh, onto the network that could potentially open up um, other use cases as well in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you and you use the word threshold a lot. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that, um, and also specifically in the context of nodes and, and what role they play in it? Yep. So we view, I think, uh, as I sort of described, the new cipher network originally is a threshold cryptography network. So it's basically purpose built to support these kinds of uh, threshold cryptography operations. And the threshold just means, um, you know, let's say instead of one server doing some computation, you spread it out across uh, several. So you're basically splitting the trust across, you know, multiple nodes in the network as opposed to trusting one node to do its job. You can th set uh, a threshold, let's say three of five. So you require three of five nodes to, to take some action or seven of 10. Basically, it's a configurable threshold um, depending on the use case and your threat model. Um, but the new Cypher network basically provides a bunch of nodes that you can choose from that set to basically select seven, 10 nodes and have a threshold of seven of them to do some operation. Um, so it's basically a way to sort of um, spread trust across multiple nodes as opposed to one and also sort of build in some redundancy as well. So if one of those nodes goes down, you know, you still have others that are able to um, uh, perform the operation. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. Um, and and I, think the, I think one of the interesting things is that like New Cipher is in some ways similar to uh, from like a functionality perspective, similar to like a Keep, where uh, like the Keep network, where it's a pretty specific kind of like cryptographic use case. But then once you're able to build like DApps and other use cases on top of it that leverage it in like really creative ways, then you start then it starts like making a lot more sense from like this kind of perspective rather than you know as McLean mm -hmm. mentioned, you and I aren't going to come to the New Cipher network and request any services personally. Um, yep. So that, that part that part I think is is very exciting. Um, but so as McLean was like tossing around numbers around like seven of ten, for example, or three or five, three or five, um, I think it's actually a really good way to segue you into uh, the work lock itself. And I, you know, I think the I think the work lock is fascinating. So maybe like to start, um, McLean, would you be able to give us like a, an overview of the work lock? Uh, yep. With a focus on kind of like what it, what is it trying to accomplish? Like what is the purpose of doing it this way? Like how did you decide on, the, on this method of distributing distributing tokens? Sure. So, as a lot of you probably picked up, like the the really important part of to make the network sort of actually work is to have a bunch of these nodes, um, you know, spread across different geographic locations that are performing these threshold cryptography services, um, and. So we, 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 we spent a lot of time thinking about how, from day one of the network, how to ensure that there is a very sort of robust set of these nodes in the network that are high quality nodes, they're you know, not going constantly offline and they're able to provide this service in a very sort of performance and, and robust manner. Um, and the way that you become a node is that you have to stake the, the new Cypher token uh, so I think like a lot of people call this model like a, a work token model. So if you want to be a node in the network, you have to get a hold of some minimum amount of stake in new tokens, and then you have to stake that, and that allows you to join the network uh, and then uh, participate in sort of performing work. And the incentive to do that is is you get paid for that work by users. So you know in the healthcare example, you know uh, as a patient, if I wanted to share my medical record with that doctor, I would pay like a little bit of ETH uh, for that service. Um, so nodes in the new Cypher network earn ETH and fees, and they also earn uh, new Cypher tokens through this inflation subsidy that we have. Uh, but the tricky thing is, like, how do you sort of ensure at the launch of the network that there's right away sort of a very good um, distribution of nodes? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how to ensure that that initial distribution of tokens is um, uh, is done well um, because you know the distribution of, no of tokens is effectively the same as the distribution of nodes, and so we we wanted to make sure that whatever kind of token distribution we did, it it the tokens ended up getting into the hands of people who would use those tokens to stake and run nodes for the network, um, as opposed to you know like through sort of a blind airdrop or an ICO or an IEO where most of the tokens are ending up in the hands of people who have no interest or capability of actually staking and running nodes, but just want to, you know, flip the tokens really quickly. Um, 
And the way the sort of solution that we came up with was the work lock. And so the work lock basically incentivizes people that are stakers and are node operators to participate in the token distribution. And how it works basically is there's a escrow period, which is happening right now. It's about halfway done, um, where anyone can permissionly escrow ETH into the work lock contract. And this will entitle them to a new stake at the launch of the network. Uh, and then once they have that new stake, they can, of course, run a node with that stake. And if they run a node for six months, the transfer, the, the, those new tokens will unlock, but they will also recover all of their escrowed ETH. Um, so basically, it's, it's uh, rewarding people that are actually running nodes. And so the only way currently to get a hold of the new Cypher token is to actively uh, do the work of running a node for the network. Uh, so it's in a way kind of mining like the permissionless proof of work, you know, mining uh, way of distributing tokens where anyone can spin up a miner and connect to, you know, the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network, for example, and uh, mine tokens. Um, but sort of replacing that sort of um, uh, hashing uh, function of mining with uh, the actual work of, of providing this service to the network. Um, it was actually largely inspired by uh, a lot of the work that the live peer team had done around uh, this thing that they called the Merkle mine. Um, I won't go into the detail of how that worked, but sort of building a, a lot onto the um, sort of the, the innovation that those, those, that team had done there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, I, I love that you evolved off of that because that was a really interesting model where you had to do actual work and, Mm -hmm. spend some technical time uh, to be able to be part of the token distribution. I think, you know, personally, the nicest thing about this one is that it's really work tied to the functionality of the network that you're launching. So it's even like you move the bar even further over to like you have to do work to get the token. Um, yeah, it's I'm very excited to see how it goes, but I think it's going to be awesome. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like the 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 I think the thing that we were super excited about with the Merkle, well, Fly Peers Merkle mod was just that it was permissionless. You know, you didn't have to, you know, there wasn't a limit in terms of like the number of participants and like an ICO. They weren't choosing who to sell the token to. Anyone could join, anyone could do this Merkle mine. Um, but they were just doing kind of this, uh, basically, people had to produce this Merkle proof, and it was kind of just sort of this. Um, computation for the sake of just getting the token. It wasn't a uh, computation that provided this actual useful service to the network, which is kind of what, I guess, the work lot kind of added on to, to the Merkle mine. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, and I like that you call it a node distribution mechanism rather than just like a token distribution mechanism. And I think that's exactly spot on. Um, and so you talk a lot about how you know how important these nodes are and like the work that they perform that, that really enable and make possible the you know the use case offered by the network um aaron so you know at best Charles, we've been running nodes on on live here on keep on new cypher um you know super familiar with with work token models um i was wondering if you could comment a little bit on you know one how like bison trails supports these nodes like what do we pay attention to what's important to us um, you know, and as new Cypher is getting up to launch, like what are some of the things that we're going to be looking at for doing, um, you know, as part of that main launch? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think broadly we take a lot of time and care to make sure that we understand the networks that we support. And so, like we said, we've been working with MacLean and, and, uh, on new Cypher for almost two years now. Um, and so over that time, we've gained a really in-depth understanding. And so the big thing that we really do is try to figure out what is like a successful operation look like. So is it doing the work it's supposed to be doing? Is it taking, is it doing re-encryption jobs? Is it calling the daily, uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm up calls. Um, so any disruption to that, we will build extensive alerting and respond to those things very, very quickly. Um, as like for the network uptime is very important. If people want these services and the nodes are down, that would be terribly disruptive. Um, you know, broadly, we also spend a lot of time just making sure the architecture is sound, that it's safe, um, that it's secure so that we don't, you know, the keys are secure. The nice thing about new Cypher and most newer protocols and, and things like this are that it's non-custodial. So we don't have to deal with custody or taking tokens. It's a sort of 
delegation model. Um, so yeah, I think we just spend most of our time operationalizing, building uh, integrations into our platform that allows anybody to come on, click a few buttons, and then they can be participating in the work lock quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. I think something else that um, we always kind of take a look at is, you know, every network has things that it wants you to do or, or doesn't want you to do. And so with a lot of proof of stake networks, that's, you know, double signing, for example, is an unwanted activity. Um, McLean, would you be able to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what don't you, what don't you want the nodes, the nodes to be doing? Like, what are some of the things that you want to avoid? Sure. So there's really in the new cipher network, there's kind of two main modes of misbehavior for a node. Uh, the first is just basically uh, correctness. So it, a node, instead of returning a proper response, just returns basically a false response or even just gar nonsense garbage um, that's not useful to the the person who's re the user that's requesting the service. Uh, and this is actually pretty easy to solve for. So in the new Cypher network, every time a node uh, does a re-encryption, they will sign um, that sort of work product. And uh, they will, uh, along with the response, they'll provide that sign, sort of uh, that signature. And so if the response is garbage, um, there'll be this sort of signature uh, associated with the, the work product that can be used to submit to, the, to, the, to basically what we have as a slashing contract called adjudicator that can take that signature and determine that it is uh, um, basically was just a junk uh, response. And as a response, it can slash uh, the node stake. Um, so that's uh, sort of the first mode of misbehavior, and it's very easy to, to prevent uh, in new cipher. The second mode of misbehavior is just a node not responding at all. Um, so more like availability. Um, and this is actually, uh, for several reasons, like much harder to solve. Um, I think it's not just uh, a, a difficult thing for us to solve for, for new cipher, but just in general for a lot of these sort of layer two protocols is if a node isn't responding, uh, one, like how do you determine that a node is, is actually not responding? Uh, because you're sort of, it's a, to some extent, it's a he said, she said, you know, dispute between the, the user that's requesting the service and the node. Um, there are ways that you can solve that um, that I think are pretty robust. Like you could, uh, if the user doesn't get a response at first, they could publish the response or sorry, the request, for example, like on a side chain that everyone could see that the request was made and like the node would have to respond back on that side chain, for example, uh, or else get slashed. Um, so you can do that, but then you also run into the problem of like, why is the node not responding? Is it because the node is actively like malicious, malicious is, is trying to mess with the user or the sort of disrupt the network more generally, or is it just, you know, unfortunately, like the node went down for some reason outside of its control, like the data center, you know, lost power, the internet connection went down, or this, maybe the node is getting DDoS, for example. Um, and so you you don't, there's no really good way to know like why a node isn't responding. So if you do decide to, to slash non-responsive nodes, um, you're sort of getting into like this weird sort of territory where you could be punishing people for really reason for for things that they have no control over, particularly if like they're actively getting DDoSed um, by some other participant in the network. So you want to make sure that you're not sort of incentivizing uh, stakers to like start DDoSing each other everywhere. Um, so currently, the the new cipher network does not slash for uh, nodes going offline. Uh, basically, what happens is for the period that the node is offline, it just won't earn rewards. So like sort of. Uh, if a node is offline for five days, it won't earn any sort of uh, new subsidy inflation for that five days. And then its remaining stake duration will also get extended by five days. Um, and if it's in the context of the work lock, uh, they won't get credit for those five days in terms of uh, the time it takes to get their ETH back. So they'd have to work five additional days uh, on the back end. Um, so currently, like the networks does slash for incorrectness, does not slash for availability. Uh, but ultimately, both of those parameters are under the control of the new Cypher DAO, which we haven't really talked about today quite yet. But uh, the DAO is basically uh, consists of all the stakers in the new Cypher network, and they are able to set certain parameters associated with the network. So like minimum and maximum price ranges, for example, uh, default prices for services, uh, the slashing parameters. 
so if um, you know once the network is live and we see sort of how things are behaving uh, in production, if enough of the stakers sort of decide that a, it makes sense actually to slash for nodes going offline, or it makes sense to slash at a higher rate for incorrect re-encryptions, uh, someone could a staker could make a proposal to the DAO, and if enough other stakers validated that proposal, um, it would be like now uh, part of the part of the protocol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like the DAO uh, needs its own like maybe two hour crowdcast. Um, <laughs> Because I mean that that stuff is that that stuff is fascinating, especially because you know you're you're making all the decisions kind of like from scratch um, and building something for the first time. Like that's never that's never existed before. Uh, so it's, it's super exciting stuff. I want to maybe like uh, go back a step to uh, you know the the slashing not not slashing but like the punishable behaviors. Um, and Aaron, I was I was actually wondering if you can comment on that. You know, I think with with new cipher, you have like incorrectly doing the work or not being responsive. Um, I mean, I'd love it if you can share a little bit about, you know, how we as bison trails think about these two as like punishment conditions, like what we're doing about them, and how does it compare to some of the other networks that we're working on? Whether it's like other work token models like Lifeir or like a Cosmos or ETH two or or something else. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think the the first one that matters the most is the one that currently. Um, you can get slash for, and so, you know, our understanding is that it's pretty hard to do a bad uh, re-encryption unless you do it on purpose. And so, I think for us, that's really just about making sure that the keys are backed up, that the keys are safely stored and secured, and that like a malicious attacker can't get access to those because that's really where, you know we're not going to do that to ourselves. And so it's really about stopping external threats uh, from getting in because then they get the keys, then they can start to do messed up stuff. Um, so we spend a lot of time on that as a company, broadly our security team, infrastructure team, just making sure that our systems are resilient. I think the downtime thing is super interesting to me. Like, I don't know how much it matters to the network, whether we are accidentally down, whether our cloud provider is down or whether we are like being attacked or whether we're down on purpose for like a malicious intent, it still causes disruptions in the service of the network. And so we kind of treat all of our infrastructure regardless of um, slashing conditions for uptime um, the same. Like we are, are very, very thorough about not going down and having multiple cloud providers, multiple regions available for in the case of like a fault, like a disaster. Um, so, you know, missing rewards is pretty, is bad enough. You know, nobody wants to miss their rewards. So we almost treat it like the same right now, I would say. So uh, it's very important. You know, like for us, it's very important that the networks are successful. And um, if our nodes are not reliable, like it won't work. And, you know, further, uh, I, I don't know that we have any like specific plans today to do this, but the new Cypher network does um, provide functionality that we kind of use internally right, like access controls and um, like the way that our internal like uh, employees access infrastructure, the way that like our customers can access our infrastructure. There is a lot of interesting infrastructure applications that we can look at, which would be kind of just cool as like a side note, if we can use some of the networks that we run to support our, our product. Uh, and that's actually, I was hoping, Michelin, you could you could touch on that because we because we have been having these conversations over the last probably year or so uh, around what that could look like, um, and I I do find it um, fascinating and that's like a very dog booty kind of thing. Um, and so, Michelin, can you talk a little bit about like key management when it comes to like infrastructure providers or key or access management rather? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think it it, uh, it depends a little bit on the use case, um, you know, what type of, so I think there are a couple ways to think about this. One is, um, and it depends on like the type of cryptograph, cryptographic primitive you're thinking about. So currently like with proxy re-encryption, basically what proxy re-encryption allows you to do is to encrypt some piece of data and it could be you know, a private key, for example, store that data in some remote storage and then grant access to that encrypted data to other valid uh, recipients. Um, 
So you could, you know, encrypt a private key and then grant other people access to that private key. Uh, the other interesting piece is when you start thinking about adding potentially other cryptographic primitives like threshold signatures, where um, you're actually splitting, you're basically, instead of splitting up the ability to re-encrypt across multiple nodes, you're splitting up the ability to sign, is to sign something across many nodes. So you could say, um, you know, as long as seven of 10 nodes in the network collectively sign, um, you know, some transaction or piece of data, uh, on my behalf, that will be considered a valid signature. Or even like if you think about distributed key generation protocols, where there isn't really even combining that with threshold signatures, so there, like, there's no um, actual really key that exists in any one place ever. Um, that also has a lot of sort of very futuristic seeming uh, you know, key management um, uh, potential use cases. So I can imagine like if if those two. Um, threshold signatures and distributed key generation were introduced onto the network by either us or someone in the community. Like I can imagine people leveraging that to build like a, some sort of staking DAO, for example, um, that could participate in validating on other networks uh, by signing blocks potentially, um, or doing some like sort of fancy stuff in, in DeFi. Um, so there's uh, a lot of interesting um, sort of key management use cases, whether it's just like controlling access to the key itself or like um, controlling like basically access to like what the functionality that you would use a key for like um, signing something. Yeah, uh, it's it's I, th I think it's fascinating, especially when you start bringing in like the staker DAO examples. Um, because there's a lot of work being done being done on that front right now by a lot of different uh, different parties. I think um, something I want to get back to a little bit is the is, is the work lock the topic for the event. Um, I was actually wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of like the participation that you're seeing in it already, like, you know, what's happening in the community, what's happening in your Discord, what's happening with, um, you know, the amount of ETH that you've already seen entered. Um, yep. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So let me, um, actually, it'll be easier if I just sort of share my screen for a second, if I can do that. Maybe I cannot. Okay. Sounds like I can't. So that's okay. But uh so i think as of this morning um there's been about fifty thousand, or not just almost fifty thousand eth escrowed uh in total and that includes both direct escrows into the work lot contract itself and then also all the deposits that have happened into uh or via CoinList. um so CoinList basically is um uh, um a simple platform that allows you to participate in the work lock um in a very like easy way um, and they sort of uh, via bison trails actually they sort of handle a lot of the node operations on on your behalf um and they're basically going to be operating one giant uh node um for all the participants via coin list um so fifty thousand eth in total across the two i think um direct escrows the total number of participants was something like uh, hundred uh, low hundred um, hundred and fifteen hundred twenty something like that um, and if you're participating directly in the work lot contract that means that you are committing to run uh, a node um, either yourself or you know using an infrastructure provider like bison trails to do so on your behalf um, and just some like I guess we haven't really talked about the, the headline stats for the work lock but approximately twenty two and a half percent of the initial new cipher tokens are being distributed through the work lock. Um, so a, a pretty significant amount. Um, and the way that it works is if you escrow directly into the work lock contract, a minimum of five ETH, you're, you're guaranteed to get the minimum new stake. So you're guaranteed to get 15,000 new, which is the minimum amount uh, that you need to run a node uh, yourself. Um, so I think you know, 50, that 50,000 ETH, like we've seen you know, pretty good participation. We're about halfway through. So there's, um, you're able to escrow until the 28th. Uh, and that's when escrows will close. Um, if you're participating through CoinList, it's like, a, I think, a day or two earlier is when deposits close. Just so they have time to, to do all the you know, technical on-chain transactions um, on their side. Um, so if you're participating through them, you'll need to finish earlier. But until the 28th directly. Uh, and I think we're I mean, so far pretty happy with the amount of participation, uh, especially given the current sort of uh, DeFi yield farming craze, which is you know, obviously locking up ETH 
in the workload contract for six months is, uh, you know, I think a pretty strong commitment that you want to run nodes on the network, uh, especially given the opportunity cost of that right now. Um, so we're very happy with, uh, with um, I think, uh, what looks like to be, it looks like it's going to be a very strong uh, amount of participation and, and uh, hopefully that translates into a, a very broad and robust set of uh, nodes operating on the network from day one. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, have you seen, like, what's the mean or median, like, that you've seen for the individuals that are participating not through CoinList? Like, are people locking up mostly five, or is it a lot of, like, uh, I'm just um, curious if, if you have that. So I can actually, I'm just going to pull up Etherscan and just see. <clears throat> um, so looking at just, like, the Etherscan transactions, there are a lot of five ETH transactions. Um, that seems to be, like, the most common, but then there's, like, a good chunk of, you know, 20 ETH, 30 ETH, you know, slightly larger ETH uh, amounts. Um, and I think it, so I think one potential thing that we'll, we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks, but my suspicion is that um, probably more people will participate directly towards the end of work lock. I think one of the issues with uh, committing to run you know, one individual node for each work lock escrow is that currently the gas prices on the Ethereum network are are kind of out of control, um, and you have to spend 200k gas per day per node, uh, and that translates recently to like about five to ten dollars a day. Um, so five to ten dollars a day for six months could be, you know, pretty significant. So I think uh, we have been advising people, you know, if you're planning to escrow five ETH, just make sure that you understand the gas situation because you're going to potentially be spending, you know. A thousand dollars, maybe two thousand dollars, maybe more if you know the price of gas goes up on operating that node for that six month work lock period. Um, so just make sure that you sort of fully understand, um, you know, what you're committing to there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think, um, for the most part, like the, the direct bids have been you know fives and you know mid double, mid double digits. Um, but uh, I think also part of that is um, there's no incentive to uh, participating or escrowing early. So you don't get additional new tokens if you escrow on the first day of work lock versus the last day of work lock. Um, so like you know, for anyone watching this, there's absolutely you know, no rush to, to you know, hurry up and escrow. Definitely take your time to understand you know, what it means to run a node. It advised probably spinning up a testnet node just sort of getting some experience and, you know, fully understanding what, what you're committing to um, in terms of the, the, the work of running a node. Um, and if you participate on the last day versus the first day, it's, you know, it's, um, there's no difference. Yeah. Plus you um, want to, you want to get those uh, yields for as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, um, so I'm, I'm not a DeFi degen. Like I, I play around a little bit, but uh, I'm particularly excited to put my ETH to work. Uh, with the work block. Um, so I'm probably going to end up running, running my own node. Um, but I was actually hoping, um, Aaron, can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how somebody would be able to use Bison Trails to participate in the work block? Um, and then also, like, what happens after the work block? What happens at the end of six months? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, from a, if you want to use Bison Trails perspective, uh, we, facilitate all of the infrastructure parts of running and participating in the work lock, which means we make it very, very easy for you to run a safe, secure node that is completely yours. It's not shared with anybody. Um, and so, you know, you work with our team, we onboard you into our platform, you click a few buttons. Um, you know, you have to, before you do that, you have to decide in kind of independent of us, like this is how much ETH I want to lock up and this is how much I want to like participate in the work lock with when it comes time to actually starting to do the work, there's a few transactions that you'll generate to sort of delegate the work over from your new cipher that you've like that that's pending to be distributed to you. Um, and you would choose the node that you would be running on our platform and your sort of lockup of the, the new, um, which will, yeah. So we do help with all of those things. There are some, I think there's like a question later or something, but there are some community built options for uh, like doing these functions. You can also do it 
connect like directly through like a my crypto interface and using the abis uh, or a command line um, so depending on your technical ability there's some like ui stuff that integrates with metamask and then there's a bunch of uh, like maybe you could do it offline if that's if you're interested in doing that as well and we have we work with all of our customers to help them through all of those steps without ever taking custody is like the key thing. We don't touch your tokens. Um, we just help you through the process. Uh, so, and then when it comes to later, um, you know, there is, uh, I believe it's like a five year emission curve for new cipher for inflation from a subsidy. Um, and so as you want to continue doing work on the network, whether it's earning ETH for the re-encryption services or earning the subsidy, you can continue running that work that that new cipher node on our platform after the work lock is over um, and continue to provide re-encryption services to the network. And so we, we're not going anywhere. Like we'll be there through work lock all the way after. Um, and, you know, hopefully as it gains adoption, the ETH will like greatly outweigh the cost of the node infrastructure as well as the, the incentives from new. Yeah, that's, that, that's really great. Um, and I think, just quickly to, to add on to the, the first part of um, of that, uh, in terms of like participating in the work lock itself, uh, there's sort of, I guess, well, three main ways. So the first is uh, you use, I'll post the links in the in the chat here. So you can use the our CLI tool. Um, you know, it obviously is, is somewhat technical. You have to be able to execute these transact, these commands from the, the command line. Um, you can also, uh, use two community there's two community built um staking uis that connect to metamask um i'll also put those in the chat uh and for all three of those options uh you can stake from a hardware wallet so you can connect a hardware wallet to a metamask to participate through the uis and you can connect a hardware wallet uh you can take from a hardware wallet with the CLI using Clef, and um, I think in the next few days, hopefully, uh, we're adding native support for that as well. Uh, and then the final way to participate is um, you know just just via CoinList, um, which is the you know the the sort of the to some extent the the easy button. Yeah. But you you lose a little bit of the flexibility. Um, so the the benefit maybe of participating directly is you have sort of full control over your staking configuration. So you can do sort of sophisticated staking strategies like, you know, restaking or not restaking your rewards, extending your stakes, splitting your stake into you know, um, multiple stakes, um, these sorts of things that might be uh, that might be interesting to you if you're um, you know participating with larger amounts or you you feel comfortable kind of um, coming up with a more sort of sophisticated uh, strategy for staking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and yeah, I double down on that. Like Coinless is really great if you want to just get in and be part of this without a lot of um, investment in like figuring everything out, and you still provide a great service to the network. But if you want to get really creative with how much you're locking up, how much you're restaking, potentially getting some early liquidity too, you would have to run the node yourself or or work with a company like us directly. Yeah, and and maybe like making that a little bit more real. Um, one of the one of the options that folks have, for example, uh, that makes sense for like larger um, l larger participants is, as McLean mentioned, like restaking. Um, and so, with for example, uh, you know, if you're participating um, directly, you can actually choose to not have rewards restake. And so, what that means is that on a on a daily basis, you would be accruing rewards that you're then able to, you know, go into DeFi with or go, you know. Uh, Play around with them or, or send them anywhere you want, um, and so that, that offers like a degree of flexibility on an ongoing basis. Um, but at this, and, and so you're able to kind of like be more intentional on, on a daily or, or weekly basis. Um, but one of the other things you can do is that you can actually go the opposite way. Um, and so like with a work lock, the standard term of participation is six months. But let's just say that for um, you know like a fairly high uh, degree of conviction in uh, in new cipher, and you actually want to participate longer. Uh, one of the nice things is that the longer that you lock up your tokens for, um, the higher the rate of reward that is granted to you by the network. Um, and so, like 12, 12 months is going to earn you more than more than more than six months from a reward perspective. Um, and so, what you're actually able to do is like have that flexibility there as well, and say like, look, most of these people are going to be doing six months. By doing it for twelve, I will be earning a higher rate of reward, and I feel pretty confident. And I can choose to have those rewards restake, um, and so like continue to kind of double up, double up and compound them. 
um, or I can have them be unstaked and therefore get some flexibility um, over the course of that year. And so, um, you know, in our, in our conversations, I think like with larger token holders that, you know, have a little bit more like strategy or a little bit more flexibility that they're looking for, uh, running a node just makes a lot of sense compared to, um, you know, trying to do it themselves or having like one set of settings for everything. Um, and so I know we're at 8.43. Um, I did want to leave about 15 minutes for Q&A, and we had some great uh, great questions come in. Um, and so if anybody's if anybody's still waiting to ask a question, now is the time. Um, but I think for now, we can start going through them. Um, Rafael Ross asked, what do you see being the main users of news? Oh, sorry, who do you see being the main users of news cipher? Individuals, organizations, can you give more examples in addition to the healthcare situation? Um, we touched on this briefly, but is there another example that you can bring up as well, McLean? Uh, sure. I think like in the in the near term, I think the most likely users are you know, other sort of uh, crypto projects, other Web three projects, decentralized applications, and other other protocols. Um, you know, the, the main reason is just they're the most sort of or the, the the group of projects that are most willing to sort of adopt new um, technology and new cryptography. Um, there's not really a specific industry that I think it's more useful for than for others. I think many industries deal with sensitive data, have to do sensitive transactions, um, and they have a use case for cryptography. We've done, um, I think the interesting thing, maybe to get a sense for the types of applications, is to look at some of the previous hackathons uh, that we've run. So we actually ran one uh, with CoinList um, about it's been about a year maybe or maybe more um they have a full list of all the submissions there and i just put the link in the chat and you can scroll scroll through that and there's everything from like genetics to um you know to sort of people trying to monetize their content by selling access to you know like a, a blog post or you know, a piece of written content or you know a you know, video stream for example you could imagine building like a decentralized spotify or decentralized Netflix type of thing using New Cipher, where people have to pay ETH uh, before they get granted access. Um, and then I think there's some sort of very obvious, like low hanging fruit things, like um, you know, decentralized encrypted Dropbox type of applications um, that people have built as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome, great example. Thank you, um, Aaron. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, People are asking about gas fees. And so one of the questions is, uh, would you be able to use the five ETH locked on the worker for paying gas fees? Uh, another another question. Yeah, is, the, oh, oh. Sorry, I was gonna say the other yeah, question. Yeah, I was gonna is, say you have to. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry, that, I think there's like a little delay. Um, yeah, you, what is the other question? Why don't you just say that and then I'll answer. <laughs> Um, another question is, uh, what happens if the gas prices continue, continue, continue going up? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think you have to really believe in New Cypher, which we do, um, to be part of this, irrespective of the gas prices. Um, they might go up. They probably will at least stay where they are. Um, and there'll be fluctuations like we've always seen based on new applications or something hot just comes online. You have to, that's what I think McLean was saying is if you're only locking up five ETH, you have to really think about like, am I gonna be spending 10 ETH potentially over the next six months to keep this thing running? Um, that's a real viable situation where you're spending significantly more than you lock up at the lowest levels. Um, I don't know, Mackling can probably comment. I don't know if they're doing any optimizations inside the smart contracts to potentially reduce gas as low as possible. I'm sure that they have done that stuff already. Um, and I think the gas doesn't come out of your delegated or, or your locked up ETH. You need to provide that on top because that ETH um, actually has to sit on the account that the infrastructure is running on that doesn't have access to any of your tokens. That's the thing that's going to be spending gas to keep this online. And so uh, you know, like we fund our own infrastructure, but because of gas prices, we've actually started passing that cost on to our customers. In the past, we haven't had to do that. Yeah, yeah, I think the I think the fees have been like really, really challenging for any um, anybody, everybody in Ethereum, but especially the um, layer two working networks. Yeah, uh, I mean, you you've even seen some of the cool wallets that added 
uh, you know, the, the, the smart contract wallets that built gas paying into their services have sort of had to walk that back too, because, you know, everyone's just going to go out of business if they have to pay for everyone's gas. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Raphael also asked another great question. Would new cipher eventually be accessible through a layer two because of the high gas fees? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest issue with gas fees and new ciphers is, is running a node. Um, it's not so much like if you're an end user and you're paying the network for services, like, I mean, you want gas costs to be lower because you have to you know, pay gas to send the transaction, but it's just standard transaction. It's, it's not particularly expensive. The Definitely the, the most impactful thing on the network regarding high gas prices is just the uh, the opposite of running a node. Um, and we, we, so the, the smart contracts for the node operations are already pretty well optimized. So I don't think there's a ton of sort of improvements that we would see on the smart contract side. We are exploring potential ways to mitigate the gas costs, whether it's through some sort of layer two or maybe reducing the frequency of this, um, of this check-in transaction. Uh, but I think for the purposes of work lock, you should assume that the gas costs are what they are and that they're not going to come down. Maybe they will come down. Um, maybe we'll do only like a weekly check-in as opposed to a daily check-in. Uh, maybe gas prices in, on ETH in general, like the network will just get less congested and you know prices will come down uh, overall. But I, I, my recommendation right now would be just to assume that it's 200K gas per day and that the recent prices are probably indicative of what the recent, uh, of what the, the prices over the next six months are going to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fair. Um, and remember, if you have a s small stake, then you're definitely welcome to, you know, go, go to CoinList. Um, they're happy to support you. So just head on over there. Um, another question is by delegating ETH, how much control do I have over the various staking configuration options? For example, the time period to lock, wind down, extend time period, enable, disable, restaking, create sub stakes, withdraw fees, rewards, et cetera. Will there be a simple UI? Um, yeah, so if you are participating directly, you have full control over those, uh, all that configuration. Uh, if you are participating through CoinList, there's one default set of configs for everyone because they're, they're essentially running, running one large node or maybe like a handful of large nodes. Uh, and for CoinList, it's a six month stake duration, winding down, restaking on. Uh, if you are participating directly, you have full control over whether you're winding down or not. You have full control over whether you're staking rewards or not, full control over extending your stake if you want to do that in order to earn a higher rate of inflation subsidy. Um, and that is that is not up to the um, the worker node that you're delegating to. So that's not, you know, Bison Trails who's running like the node for you doesn't set those parameters. You as a staker uh, set those parameters. And you can do that either through the, the command line you can do that through both of the staking UIs uh, that I that were developed by community members that I linked above that have sort of uh, fairly like straightforward, intuitive ways to do that. Um, but um, yeah, participating indirectly, that is up to you as a staker. Um, and even in, um, you even have the ability to like, uh, as a staker, you, you choose which worker node you bond to. So let's say you are running your own node and you know, cloud provider somewhere, you bond to the, that worker node, uh, and then you can also you decide you don't want to run your own run, own node anymore. You want to delegate to Bison Trails to run your node. You can detach from that worker and then bind your stake to now a, a node run by Bison Trails. Yeah, awesome. Um, I see another question: How many ETH is estimated for six months of checkpoints? Uh, so I'll I, I can take that one real quick. Um, as part of participating in the work lock, you actually, if you do enough work, you get all of your ETH back. Um, and so if you stake for six months, it's expected that you're going to earn all, or get all your ETH back uh, in a linear fashion over those six months. And so what actually happens is that you get a little bit of ETH back um, every day in that the rate of ETH returned to you is based off how much work you perform in the network. Um, and that work is measured by how much inflation or rewards you're getting. And so uh, if you want to, you can get it back linearly over six months or alternatively, and this is again where like the strategic piece comes in. If you chose to stake for 12 months instead of six, then you would actually get your ETH back at an accelerated rate. And so you get your ETH back in roughly about four months 
Um, and it's again, because you're, you're performing that work on the network. Um, and, these, and these aren't like exact timelines um, in that it, it depends on what other nodes in the network are doing. But this is just one of those things where you have a little bit of a little bit of flexibility. I think it's it's also possible. The question is about how much ETH is estimated for gas for six months of checkpoints, which is a little harder to answer. Yeah. Um, it you know it's two hundred k per day of gas, and then the gas price will drive how much ETH. And so you could look at maybe the average last seven days or last 14 days and think maybe it'll be something similar to that over the next six months and just multiply to estimate. I don't have those numbers. I don't know. Um, maybe McLean or Victor, you do, but that's what I would do to figure out what I potentially would have to spend. Yeah. Yeah. I think recently, I mean, it's varied a lot because the gas prices have been all over the place the last few weeks, but recently it's been you know, 200 K gas. I think has been about five to 10, $10 on, on most days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'd be looking at you know a thousand dollars or more um, easily in in gas costs for these six months. Um, yeah, twenty is twenty. Yeah, so I mean a thousand bucks is what two and a half ETH right now ish, three ETH. Uh, I don't know what the, yeah. I don't know what the price is. Um, and you know, frankly, I think that uh, we will probably still see um, you know higher higher prices given like where things are going. And so I would not be surprised if it ended up being somewhere between five and ten. Um, okay, uh, you are saying that return depends on work you do. What actually uh, affect the amount of work do you do? Does it depend on your stake or, or something else? Um, McLean? Sure, so basically we consider being available doing work. Uh, so it's not, we, we, uh, the work lock doesn't look at, okay, did you do X number of, of re-encryptions? It's more like, were you available for work on this day. Um, and if you were, then it's considered that you've done the work. And so basically the work lock looks and watches to see if your staker address has been earning inflation. And it uses that as a proxy for being av available. Because the only way that your your node or your staker address will earn inflation is if it is actually available. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it's been earning inflation, then the work lock contract assumes, that, okay, you've been doing this work. Uh, and then like the amount of work is just basically the amount of inflation. So you can do, you can earn more inflation and do more work by, for example, extending your stake. So taking it from six months to 12 months by restaking rewards so that your stake gets bigger uh, by turning wind down off so that it's like always at 12 months as opposed to like counting down over time. Um, so those are the things you can do to um, produce more work. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things there is that, um, in like in a perfect world, it would be very nice if right away there was a ton of re-encryption work going on in the network and lots of policies being created and lots of use cases. Um, and then the work that the node is performing or like the additional rewards is tied based off of, you know, how many times are you performing proxy re-encryption? Are you doing it correctly? Um, and, I, and I think this is actually like one of those things that maybe deserves like a whole blog post on its own, um, is around like how do you we do actually it? have? Oh uh, yeah. yeah, oh great. <laughs> More like uh, Gata. So Gata, who is a photographer researcher for us, she wrote. Um, let me find it. Just a post on like this on this problem. Like how do you measure work in a robust way in a decentralized network? Not, I mean, obviously, like the she looks at newsletter from most closely, but just sort of treating these layer two networks um, just in general as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. Um, so uh, sorry, I'm late, blah, blah, blah. Um, some other questions that came in, uh, Anna asked how much ETH is locked in the work lock so far. Also, where can we track this? Um, there's about, as McLean touched on it earlier, there's about 50,000 ETH locked so far. Um, some of it, or a lot of it, is actually in Coinless. And so if you go to coinless.co, I believe it's forward slash work lock. Um, the, the link is in the comments. Um, over there, you, yeah, uh, new cipher dash work lock, that's what it is. Um, over there, you're actually able to see um, on, a day, on a daily basis the amount of ETH that's been locked with Coinless so far. Um, and there's also an address um, that we created doing dashboard for where you can track it uh, for people that participated directly through the through the contract itself and plan to run nodes. 
Um, I don't have that up in front of me, but I'll post it in the in the comments um, later on as well, unless Austin or Mark or somebody else can get it. Uh, I think I have it. So yeah. there's the EtherScan page for the the work lab contract itself. Um, um, one thing that uh, you shouldn't you should use the sort of escrow functionality. You shouldn't send ETH directly to this contract. Um, if you do, like it's supposed to return it to you, but I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't test it. I would just use the recommended ways to participate and not send it directly to the, the contract address. Yeah, yeah. Please, please, please don't do that. Um, in DeFi, there's been a couple of million dollar losses recently. Um, I know we're we're just about coming up on on one last minute. There's still some great questions, um, but I think that maybe some of the next questions could be asked in a follow up, um, so that we wrap up on time. Um, McLean and, and Aaron, can you guys share uh, any like closing thoughts, things you want to leave the audience with, and also like the best ways to to reach out to you afterwards, or reach out to your companies rather? Sure. So for for New Cipher, um, we're probably our team is most active in Discord. Um, so if you just go to discord.newcipher.com, uh, I imagine most a lot of people watching this webinar are probably there already, but that is uh, sort of where we do all of our development. And uh, there's also several channels for like the, participating in the work lock, and we can answer like technical support questions there. There's also uh, that's where most of like the the staking community is. So there's a, a channel for staking, which you know, Bison Trails and a bunch of the other infrastructure providers are in, as well as individual node operators, um, and that's a great place just to learn about running nodes and get comfortable with it uh, if you need help. Um, I think like right now, if you're thinking about participating in the work block, um, especially if you're thinking about doing it di directly, I would recommend uh, heading to our website and going to our docs, which is docs.newcipher.com and following the instructions there and spinning up a testnet node. Uh, so you can get testnet tokens uh, from our, there's a faucet in our Discord server and I would just recommend just trying that out and running uh, running a testnet node for a while and seeing you know how comfortable you are installing and configuring everything and, and getting it up and running. Um, I think that is that would for for someone considering whether to participate, that would be my uh, my first recommendation. Awesome, thanks for playing, Aaron. Yeah, I, I would say. Uh... In addition to all of those great recommendations, I think it's important that you, um, you know, join the Discord and the community for New Cipher. We're in there, so if you have any questions, um, we have a few folks that are in in a bunch of the channels around staking and, and node running. We're happy to answer any questions that we can help with. Um, yeah, I think if you're interested in participating uh, and you want sort of all of the flexibility that run, like delegating yourself gives you. But at the same time, like you don't want to do the infrastructure work itself, that's where we come in. And so we can provide really, really great infrastructure support, but you can have all of the control over the way that you're participating, the governance that you eventually get to participate in. Like there's a ton of cool stuff. You don't need to be an infrastructure expert and cloud technology expert in order to participate and do work and contribute. Um, so that's really what our company is about lowering the barriers to participating in these networks. And so we make it really easy. Um, I think someone linked there's, you can just go to our contact page um, and reach out and somebody will talk to you um, and we'd, we'd be happy to work with you. So just let us know. But yeah, I think educating yourself first uh, through all of the, the, um, the stuff that New Cypher has put out through their blog, through their community, so that you understand what you're getting into is a big first step. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And anything maybe like the last thing that I'll add there is, you know, we're available to you. I'm available to you. Um, you know, our protocol operations team works very closely with our customers to help them understand how all this, you know, comes together, how they should be thinking about their decisions, uh, providing them with the right information. And so, yeah, definitely reach out to us. Um, if anything, you can also find me on on Discord just with my first last name. Um, so yeah, let us know. But in the meantime. Uh, McLean, Aaron, I wanted to thank both of you for taking the time. I wanted to thank the audience for, for taking the time to join us. Um, I hope that this was, <laughs> I'm also very available on Twitter <laughs> uh, and my DMs are open. 
Um, I just want to say thank you everybody for joining us. I hope that this was, um, you know, informative and interesting and, and, you know, definitely follow up with McLean or Aaron or me and uh, we'll get you guys all figured out. Victor, Aaron, thank you guys. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Bye.